All right. Uh, with that, um, welcome everyone to today's webinar on backyard poultry production. Uh, just as a few housekeeping items before we get started, uh, please put any questions for Tim uh, about his presentation or about poultry production in general in the Q&A. That can be found, uh, I think for most folks, that's at the bar at the bottom of the screen. Uh, it should be an option next to the chat box. If you have questions about anything else, uh, for example, tech issues, please put those in the chat box along with any uh, side conversations that you have. So uh, anyone who is attending from Jefferson County 4-H and would like credit, please email Angie Allison at allison.325 at osu.edu if you have not already done so. Um, I will go ahead and add her email to the chat here in, a, in the next few minutes. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Erica Lyon. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator for OSU Extension in Jefferson and Harrison counties. Um, my fellow moderator uh, today here is Angie Allison. She is the 4-H Youth Development Educator in Jefferson County. And our speaker today is Tim McDermott. Tim McDermott is an Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator in Franklin County. Prior to coming to Extension, Tim's background is in veterinary medicine and has since given many presentations on raising backyard poultry. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Tim. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, Angie. All right, gang, we are gonna do a backyard poultry production class to introduce you to the basics of keeping chickens at home. Um, if you have any questions, like Erica said, dump them into the Q&A. What I'll probably do is bop up there periodically to try to address them close to when I address the topic. And I think we will have some extra time at the end to try to get through any questions that we might have at the end as well. So the first thing when you are thinking about if you want to keep back our poultry production is what is your purpose? Do you want to get birds for meat production? Do you want to get egg production? There are a number of different breeds that are elite at being harvested for meat or elite at laying eggs. And then there's a whole bunch of different breeds that are known as dual purpose breeds, meaning that they will grow to a harvestable size over a couple of years while they're given a nice stream of eggs. Um, and so they do a little bit of both. And then there are some show breeds that are out there. And then once you figure your purpose out, Make sure you know your terms because you know how it is with livestock projects. Every different species has the own, their own specific terms that way. And everybody knows chickens are hen and a rooster and a baby chicken is a chick. A pullet is an immature female chicken. A cockerel is an immature male chicken. They come into sexual maturity around 20 to 22 weeks. In turkeys, males are toms, females are hens, babies are poults. So one thing to realize is back in the day, and this is probably nearly 100 years ago, the poultry industry was much different than it is now. And in fact, a lot of people, almost everybody kept poultry that might have been in the backyard that was for meat, that was for eggs. And there was um, a number of diseases that were affected people's birds. And one of those um, really devastating ones was Salmonella pylorum, which causes pylorum disease. And that is a disease that can have very high mortality rates. So the government came up with the National Poultry Improvement Plan in order to eradicate that disease. And now hatcheries participate in this plan where they target these diseases that are listed, and this is voluntary, but that's salmonella plus a couple other salmonellas, and then some mycoplasmas and high path avian influenza. And what they do is through a mix of vaccines and testing their breeding stock, they ensure that if you order from an NPIP approved hatchery or wherever you got your birds, got them from there, that is a great way to ensure that you start with a healthy flock. Now, before you order your birds online or go pick them up at Tractor Supply or Rural King, make sure you are allowed to do so. I've spoken on this topic all over the state in many, many counties and many, many cities. And one thing I can tell you is there is no one reliable set of rules and regulations. It's amazing how fragmented it is all over the place. Some allow um, meat birds and layers, some allow layers only, some don't allow any birds whatsoever. And so make sure that you're allowed to keep birds. And then you see these FedEx boxes right here. When you order for your birds from a hatchery, they mail those one day old birds to you. And what you need to make sure is that you 
plan this arrival and you time it so that you have everything ready and you know you're going to be there when those birds arrive because shipping livestock is a very stressful thing in their life and, and they are predisposed to disease because that stress has decreased their immune system. You need to make sure that you have everything ready. This isn't like when you go buy a puppy at the pet shop where you can get the puppy, then get the food, get in collars and bowls and do fun stuff like that. You have these one day old baby birds that have just been mailed to you. They need to come out of the box. They need to go into the brooder and they need to get started um, with their best healthy start. So what is brooding chicks? Brooding chicks is raising chicks and from the day you get them until they're about five or six weeks of age. And what that is, is that is the time period where they're growing out some feathers and they are beginning to be able to do their own thermoregulation. For your brooder, you need a clean, dry, warm, ventilated space and there's lots of different things. I've seen anything from stock tanks to those plastic little baby pools that you have um, for your backyard. Something that you can clean easily. Make sure that you've cleaned it in enough time ahead of time that if there was any fumes from cleaning, they've dissipated. That way, once they get in there, they don't have any complications. If there's bad air quality, make sure you have enough space for the birds to move around as well as you have space for the water and the feeder in there. And then make sure that you have your heat source already secured, it's been turned on and you have pre-warmed your brooder to the temperature it needs to be. And that temperature is around 90 to 95 degrees. Birds are, they run hotter than us, they run 100 plus and they need to make sure that since they can't really generate their own heat, that they're in a place that is at a temperature that they're going to do well at. And you need to measure that. And you need to measure it basically as if the thermometer was right at the level of that baby bird, about two inches tall. Easiest way that I've found to do that is you get one of those metal oven thermometers. Um, they're kind of old school, but you will find that they're about the same size as a baby bird. You put that right under the heat element and that's going to give you an accurate reading. And then make sure that you are checking that daily and you're decreasing your heat five degrees every week. And what that does is allows those baby chicks as they grow to acclimate and begin to conserve their own heat and thermoregulate themselves. That takes about six weeks. Make sure that you secure whatever you use, especially if it's a heat lamp, very securely. Because what you don't want it to have happen is if you have it just secured by plugging in the cord, you don't want it to come um, unplugged and then fall into that brooder because then you would have a real problem on your hands. And then I like to say monitor very carefully. And that's not just temperature. That's not just the feeders and the waterers, but that's monitor the birds very carefully, meaning you want to watch how they do their activity. You want to make sure that they're all running around and they're active, that you don't see any ones that have any injuries. When I look at this picture, and I took this picture at the tractor supply in Logan, Ohio, probably about three, four years ago, I saw a lot of birds that were just huddled on top of each other, trying to conserve their heat. This, I was standing where the front door was. This is the coldest part of the brooder. This was right by the front door when you walked in. And I think when I look at this, what I felt like is those baby birds were cold and they were huddling together for warmth. And if they pile on top of each other, they're fragile enough that they could injure each other. So you can learn a lot just by watching the birds to make sure that what they're doing um, is correct in terms of just their activity level. And here's something to consider, especially depending on what the rules and regulations of your municipality would be is, do you need a rooster? And you only need a rooster if you want fertilized eggs, because a hen, when she comes into lay, she's going to start laying eggs, whether there's a rooster there or not. All the eggs that you would buy in a carton at the store are unfertilized eggs. There's no roosters whatsoever in those um, egg layer operations. And so make sure that you're allowed to keep one and then understand what you're getting into when you get a rooster because they can be aggressive and they can be noisy. So if you're ordering your birds and if you go online and you check out a website that sells you baby birds, you're going to notice that you could order males, you could order females, 
or you could order straight run. And it's very difficult to sex a one day old baby bird, but folks at the hatcheries are pretty good at it. But what a straight run is, is that's an unsexed bird. It has a chance of being a male or a female. And so if you order 10 of them, you might get 10 roosters, you might get 10 hens, or you might get any permutation of that. So make sure you specify that. If you want just layers, you have to request just layers. Now, when you go to a store to buy baby birds, and this is common, we're kind of out of chick season a little bit right now. It's more of a March, April thing, but I'll bet you there's still some places that are selling them. Generally, those hatcheries will get birds that are mostly all straight run. And, or, um, and so the stores will have, usually have one or two meat birds, one or two egg layers. They, they might have a couple few dual purpose. They might have a show bird. And then what you'll see there is you'll see a label for either red sex linked or black sex linked. And what that means is this, avian chromosomes are different than our mammalian chromosomes. And what they have found over time is when you breed certain breeds of birds together, their offspring come out a certain color based on their sex. And what that allows you to do is if you go there and all the birds are labeled straight run of some of the other varieties that are there, you can pick a sex linked one, knowing that if you pick the right color, you are going to get pure layers. Now, it might not be the most elite egg laying bird. Uh, it's probably going to be a dual purpose hybrid with a dual purpose, but it's still going to do a good job laying eggs for you for a couple of years. And it will make sure that you're not getting straight run. You're getting the one that you want. So that's what that term means. If you ever go um, to a, a store and you want to buy baby chicks. All right, let's talk about water and waters. Water is their most important nutrient and they need fresh water every day. And I like it to be checked twice per day. And the reason is some of these waters can fail. Sometimes that water can get dirty, it can get spilled. Um, and it, depending on how hot it is, they might need more, right? We had 90 degrees here today. Hens drink 25% of their body weight in the last um, two hours before the day ends. And eggs are one third water. So they really need to have fresh water. You need to be checking it a couple times a day. And I like waters that are suspended off the ground. You can see if you put food and water on the ground, generally they get contaminated. The birds are gonna poop in them or spill food in them. Rodents or bugs are gonna get in there. So I like waters and feeders off the ground. And here's a couple of options that I like. So if you have a whole bunch of birds, sometimes folks will actually run a dedicated like a PVC line and then they'll put a number of different waterers down that PVC line and just plummet right in there. And what this is, is this is a cup that fills with water and when the float goes up, when the bowl is full, it shuts off the water flow. After they drink a bunch and that float goes down, then it fills up with water. And then this is one I like too. If you have a smaller flock, what this is, is this is a set of nipples that you purchase and they, then you drill a little hole and there's like um, little grommets and, and you tighten these down so they don't leak. But basically you can fill the bucket with water. And then when they peck at it, it dribbles out and they can drink it. And any bucket, like a five gallon bucket of work, I like it, you can put a lid on it so nothing falls in there. I really like the clear one because you can see your water level just when you walk in there. And so the other thing I like to say, especially when I'm talking to 4-H youth is this, your livestock project wants to drink out of a glass and eat off a plate that is exactly as clean as the glass you drink out of and the plate that you eat off of, but they have no say in the matter. So make sure that you get waterers and feeders that you can clean and you clean them frequently. You, the cleaner that you keep them, the less chance that they're going to pick up any kind of disease or something from contaminated feed and water. So feed and feeding is very, very similar. I like the feeder off the ground. I like it cleanable. I like ones that you can sterilize. Um, off the ground means that you're keeping it away from rodents. And then you hang that up around sort of right below where the neck is on the bird. So she can get in there and she can eat, but she can't spill it or poop in it or waste it. And that's gonna make it more efficient. And that's gonna save you some money to minimize your wastage. And, um, and, and then periodically you're gonna pull this down and you're gonna clean it, sterilize it before you put it back up there. Now, one of the things about chickens is 
they have certain uses and certain life stages that they mature through. And while it's really important that we match our nutrition for our life stage in all species, this is an instance because they are maturing from chicks into egg layers that you absolutely have to make sure that you are feeding the bird the food intended for the use in the age. And if you don't, you can have some serious medical problems result from that. So their, their feeds are generally corn and soybeans, and then they have vitamins and minerals added, and, and that changes as they mature through the various life stages. Generally, when they're in the brooder, for the first five, maybe six weeks, they're going to get starter feed. And what that is, is it's a smaller crumble, so a chick can eat it. And it's a little higher in protein. Plus, what it has in it is a medication called a coccidiostat. And what that does is there is a protozoal parasite that affects chickens and really can affect them negatively. And that's called coccidia. Coccidia is actually present in any number of different species. Humans get coccidia, dogs, cats, all, all these various species that um, I dealt with in veterinary medicine get coccidia. Four species really get it hard. Chickens are one of them. And then you have um, uh, puppy dogs, bunny rabbits, and, and small ruminants like goats. But they have to, as they grow, all species deals with coccidia by maturing their immune system and becoming immunocompetent to where they can fight off the coccidia on their own. What this mild amount of amprolium in the chick starter does is it sort of suppresses the coccidia enough that it's not going to affect the chick and allows that chick to develop that immune response. Because this is not a medically important to human medication, this is not a VFD feed, you can get this over the counter. But this isn't something you would feed to layers. There's not enough calcium in there. This is for chicks um, from you know zero to six weeks or so. If you want to raise your birds organically, um, you would not use a medicated chick starter. Uh, what you would have to do is you'd have to use sort of a controlled sanitation process, meaning you want to, and, and this is easy to say, but hard to do, you want the birds to um, be exposed to very tiny amounts of coccidia. So they develop the immune response, but not enough that they're actually going to get um, sick from it because there's many, many strains of coccidia in these birds and they can be fatal in some cases. So grower feed basically takes you from chick starter up to sexual maturity. Um, if you're going to be a meat bird, you're harvested way, way before sexual maturity. Uh, meat birds are harvested before 12 weeks of age. And, but this is the one that basically you get up until your bird becomes a layer. Now, one of the things, and I put this on that slide, is it's okay to supplement rations um, because you know, birds are really social and everybody likes interacting with their backyard flock, but we are keeping birds for a long time now and we're starting to see obesity related disorders. So make sure that you keep your treats a small amount. The end of the day is better because that means that they've taken in all their nutrition that they need during the day. And then um, unprocessed ones, um, you, you know, like I don't like where you're feeding them like bread or crackers or things like that. That can actually mess up um, uh, some of the different processes they have in their GI tract. So layer feed. Layer feed is when they come into lay about 20 to 22 weeks. And the thing that sets this apart is it's very high in calcium. And what happens is you have to have a very high level of calcium in the feed for a layer because they lay about an egg a day. And there's a tremendous amount of calcium present in those eggs. And the thing about a layer is if the feed is calcium deficient, they will actually keep laying eggs. They'll start to pull that calcium out of their bones and they can have some serious medical complications with this um, as it occurs chronically over time. And that can be pretty tricky to try to reverse down the line. So when they get to sexual maturity, they need to be um, placed onto layer feed just to make sure that they have enough calcium in their diet so that they will be able to produce eggs um, with normal shells and, and no negative effects on their system. So housing is an important one now too. The questions are, um, a lot, there's lots of different, there's lots of different little things you want to do with these. There's any number of different shapes and sizes. You'll go on the internet and see a billion plans for chicken coops out there. Um, you want at least two square feet per bird. 
whether you want it heatable or not is up to you. Um, we'll talk about uh, overwintering your coop. There's really two huge things that you need to factor in when you are building yourself a chicken coop. And that is, did you make it predator proof? And did you make it cleanable? Because if you think what is in a chicken coop, you have chickens, you have eggs, and you have chicken feed. And that is food that the vast majority of every um, animal on this planet eats. And so if you think about it, predators want to get in that coop. When you lock up your birds at the end of the night and you go in when it gets dark, all the predators in the neighborhood come out to that coop and they stare at it all night long, figuring out how to get in there. And really, it, very few things are more devastating than to have a predator get in to a coop and cause damage to the birds. So make sure it is rock solid predator proof. And then the other thing you want to make sure it is, is cleanable because these are livestock. And even, you know, when we keep animals and that's livestock, that's dogs, that's cats, they generate manure. We have to have a manure management plan. And part of that plan is we need to clean it up and get it out of the environment. The more it builds up, the more the environment can have odors, it can attract flies or vermin, and um, it can have some negative impacts on health, both for the birds and for the people, quite honestly, because there's pathogens in there. So make sure that you have it easy to clean. If you have it easy to clean, you might clean it. If you make it hard to clean, you'll never clean it. And when I look at this, you know, I wondered to myself, if this was my coop, how often would I get on my hands and knees and crawl through this run, scooping up chicken manure in there? And the answer is, I probably wouldn't want to do that very much. And so this is a coop that I wonder about how often it gets cleaned. Housing is very similar. You want some nest boxes in there, maybe one for every four or five hen. You're going to need to clean those very frequently as well. I like to say the way you maintain your eggs being clean, the easiest way is for eggs to fall out on a clean straw. If they fall on a clean straw, they stay clean. If they fall out into dirty straw, they get dirty right away. And then one of the things about keeping birds that a lot of people do and what they do in industry is they provide supplemental lighting. And what that does is that keeps the chickens in production. They need to have at least 14 to 16 hours and people will set a timer. You need, you don't need a tremendous amount of light. Um, you do need to periodically change the bulbs because they'll lose intensity and we won't notice that. Um, but that will allow you to get uh, eggs over the course of uh, a whole year. Um, and when I put this picture up, a lot of times I put pictures up that are things that I recommend, and sometimes I put pictures up of things that I don't recommend. And this is one that when I look at this and I see these nest boxes and I see this perch, which is right on the edge, you know, I wonder if those birds would be perching on there, if they're going to be defecating, how much manure falls right into these nest boxes, and how easy is it to clean these things? I mean, five gallon buckets are pretty easy to clean generally, but, but maybe sighting that perch so that it's not right over that opening might be better and that way you don't get some fecal material going right into that nest. Good way to keep your eggs clean. All right. All righty. So this is a coop I really, really like. This is a rock solid coop. If you look at it, you have some heavy gauge wire on there, sturdy roof that diverts water away from the coop. That way, if it's raining, the water is not just running into the run multiple people sized doors so you can get in here, you can get in the run, that way you can get in there and clean. One of the things that we wanna make sure that we think about is air quality. You wanna make sure that it is not drafty, but it needs to be ventilated. And so this is a, a, um, a picture of how you can provide ventilation in winter, where what they did is using a similar technique that they use say in a dairy, they can raise the plastic up from the bottom to a certain height. And what that does is that keeps the wind off the birds at ground level, but any of the ammonia buildup from um, any of the manure sitting in any bedding, that's gonna be brought right out. So like with most livestock, the rule of thumb is this, they can tolerate cold as long as they're not wet and they need ventilation 
but it can't be drafty. If you think about the difference, if you are outside on a really cold day, but it's sunny and there's no wind, it could be 20 degrees and you can feel pretty good. You could be outside on a 47 degree day and it could be spitty rain with a breeze and you are shivering. So that is the rule of thumb with livestock is they can tolerate cold, but provide breaks from the wind, make sure they're ventilated and make sure they have a place that they can go if they need to be dry. All right, so let's talk about litter for a second. There's lots of different choices out there for litter. Um, I'm not a huge fan of sawdust. I know that there's a lot of industry operations that are sited near sawmills, so they'll use sawdust, but they can manage it differently. In the coop, sawdust is a moisture magnet, and moisture is the enemy in the coop because if you mix water, organic matter, and manure, you start building up um, some fumes pretty quickly with that breakdown product. I like straw bales and I like pine shavings. The problem is, is they used to be really inexpensive, downright cheap even, and now they're really expensive. A, a bale of straw in Columbus, Ohio is gonna run you 10 bucks, which is crazy to me, but prices are up for a lot of different things. One of the recommendations that a lot of my colleagues have um, given over the years is, at least for out in the run, construction sand can be a great substrate for bedding out there. And construction sand is not like beach sand or play sand. What that is, is it is found at like a builder's supply. You pick it up in bulk. It's like the bottom of a creek bed. It's particles of all different sizes. And what it does is it basically makes almost like a litter box effect out in that run. And, and that can be a great thing because when they defecate, their fecal ball can fall right on top of this. It can dry out and you can literally pooper scooper this and it's inorganic. And that really goes a long way towards minimizing disease. And if water get, spills on it, you just have this built up to about four to six inches tall and water just drains right out in there. So I know a lot of small flock producers, what they do in the coop is they'll bed it down maybe with some straw or some pine shavings. And then out in the run, they have a four to six inch pad of the construction sand. And when they clean, they just adapted almost like a long handled pooper scooper and you just scoop that up and, and then you just fluff up that sand with a garden rake and you're good to go. So let's talk about eggs, okay? They make about one egg per day. It usually comes out in the morning and it comes out wet. And if you've never looked at the back end of a chicken, there is only one opening back there and everything comes out of that opening. That's the feces and that's the eggs. And so it's very common for eggs to be contaminated the minute they come out, even if they look completely pristine, right? Because you can't see bacteria. You can't see one, you can't see a thousand of them. And so a lot of folks will wash eggs to make sure that they're trying to get that um, bacterial contamination off. But keep in mind that eggs have pores. And what can happen is if you haven't completely matched the temperature of your wash water to the temperature of the egg, and you have that gradient reversed, you can actually suck wash water that's contaminated into the egg. And so um, if you would like to have that information, OSU Extension has a fact sheet on how to correctly wash eggs. Um, and I will get that to Erica. Uh, Erica, that's an Ohio line one, but it's not a poultry one. It is a food safety one. And I want to say that it is eggs for sales at markets or something like that. I have it linked okay. um, on my website, but if you want to, if you can find that, if not, I can find it when we're done. And then, so I tell folks, if that egg freezes, if it's really dirty, if it's cracked, if it looks weird, just pitch it. She's going to make another one tomorrow. But make sure you understand that even if you wash it and, and it looks clean, there can still be contamination there because bacteria are absolutely microscopic and you can have a lot of them on there and not know about that, which is why when you go to a restaurant, they always say, you know, we recommend eggs fully cooked. We recommend your burgers for fully cooked and everything like that because they're, they're, um, that disclaimer is to make sure that the food is cooked to the temperature that would kill any potential pathogens like E. coli or salmonellas. All right, we are gonna watch a really cool video and this goes over egg production. Auburn University Department of Erica, Science make sure you can hear the gentleman narrating. Safety and Quality Peaks of Excellence Program. Yeah, I can hear him. Great. The U.S. Department of Agriculture. In a hen, an ovary and an oviduct make up the reproductive system that creates an egg. 
The yolk grows in the ovary, and the rest of the egg forms around the yolk as it passes through the oviduct. Most females have two ovaries, but birds are unusual and have only one. A hen's ovary rests against the back body wall, just to the left of the spinal column. The oviduct begins at the ovary, folds back and forth upon itself, and leaves the hen's body through the vent, just below the tail. The ovary and the oviduct occupy a surprisingly small space within the body of the hen, only a few cubic inches. But when the oviduct is stretched out, it's nearly two feet long and has five distinct sections. The infundibulum, the magnum, the isthmus, the shell gland, and the vagina. When a hen is actively laying, nutrients from the food she eats are converted into the building blocks of egg yolk. These building blocks, one-third protein, one-third fat, and one-third water, are then carried by the bloodstream from the liver to the ovary. In the ovary, tiny tissue bags called follicles fill with yolk and grow. The largest follicle on the ovary will release the yolk of the egg the hen will lay tomorrow while the next largest will produce the next day's yolk, and the next largest will yield the next day's yolk, and so on. In one to two weeks, a follicle grows from less than one millimeter in diameter to the mature size of 25 millimeters. When a yolk matures, the follicle ruptures along a line relatively free from blood vessels, the stigma, and the yolk is released. If any blood vessels cross the stigma, a drop of blood may spot the yolk as it is released from the follicle. Called the infundibulum, the funnel-shaped upper end of the oviduct envelops the ovary and catches the most mature follicle as it reaches maturation and ovulates. Then the yolk embarks on a 24-hour journey down the oviduct. When the yolk emerges from the follicle and moves into the upper part of the infundibulum, it's the only time in its progress when it is not covered by a layer of albumin. Fertilization, if it is to occur, will take place here. Some bacterial pathogens, such as Salmonella enteritidis, are able to colonize the reproductive tracts of infected hens. If these bacteria become associated with a developing egg as it passes along the tract, and before it is surrounded by a shell, they can cause disease in a human consumer of the contaminated yolk or albumin. The yolk spends about 15 minutes in the infundibulum before it passes into the magnum. In the magnum, over a period of about three hours, it will be covered by a dense, shock-absorbing layer of albumin, or egg white. As the albumin forms around the yolk, spiral ridges which run the length of the magnum cause the yolk to spin like a bullet in a rifle barrel. This spinning twists the protein fibers in the albumin just in front of and just behind the yolk and makes two pigtail-like structures called the chalaza. The chalaza keep the yolk suspended in the center of the albumen and ultimately prevent it from moving around inside the egg.
The magnum gives way to the next section of the oviduct, the isthmus. Here, the shell membranes are deposited. These thin layers of protein wrap loosely around the albumen covering the yolk. It is as though the yolk and its layer of albumen are a blob of jello wrapped with two sheets of cellophane. The process does not result in a smooth egg-shaped structure. In fact, an egg leaving the isthmus probably looks more like a prune than a plum. The partially formed egg then enters the shell gland. Here, over the next 20 hours, the shell will form. First, a thin albumin is secreted. This thin albumin is mostly water, and it moves by osmosis through the two shell membranes into the highly concentrated thick albumin surrounding the yolk. This plumps the egg into a normal shape and stretches the shell membranes tight around it. Next, a highly concentrated solution of calcium carbonate is secreted by the shell gland and crystals of calcite form and grow on the outer shell membrane. As the crystals expand, they grow into one another to form a solid shell. Very tiny spaces left in between the crystals leave pores in the shell. Lastly, a special protein solution, called the cuticle, is deposited onto the eggshell. Gas can pass through the proteinaceous cuticle and through the pores in the shell but the two layers protect the egg from harmful bacteria. Finally, in a process called oviposition, the egg flips end over end. This occurs through contractions of the uterus, synchronized with relaxation of the muscular vagina and pushes the egg out of the hen's body. An important part of the egg does not form until after it is laid. When an egg is laid, it fills the shell. However, a hen's body temperature is 106 degrees Fahrenheit and eggs are generally laid into environments that are 20 to 40 degrees cooler. As the egg cools, the inner portion contracts and forms an air cell between the two shell membranes. A chick would puncture and breathe through the air in this cell before hatching. The fully formed egg now begins a so is that cool or what? Um, that is called the virtual chicken. And you can find that if you want to watch it again on YouTube. It's by Auburn University. And it does a way better job than I could possibly do at showing the process of how an egg is created. Because that's so radically different than what we have in you know, mammalian anatomy. One thing that is really important to note is you saw that even as far up in the repro tract as the infundibulum, that the yolk can come in contact with salmonella, salmonella aniridis. That's one of the salmonellas that was in NPIP. That's generally asymptomatic in chickens, but that's the salmonella that makes us very sick. And no matter how much you wash, you still have the potential to encounter that because it's already on the inside. All right, I'm bopping up into the chat because I see we got a bunch. And thank you, Erica. All right, cool. That is cool, gang. That is seriously cool. If you want to watch another really cool one on YouTube, there's a virtual chicken digestive track that is computer generated like that one, and it's made by NC State. So we talked about this earlier. Manure management is critical for all species, right? Dog, cat have pathogens that can affect you. Uh, livestock, that can be cattle, that can be small ruminants, that can be horses, and that's chicken too. You can, you can compost chicken manure. Um, this is one that has more nitrogen to carbon ratio than a lot of different manures. Some people will bag it and throw it away. Some will have it haul away. The key thing is 
make sure you have a plan because you don't want to let it build up. You can um, attract bugs, disease, smells, um, uh, lots of problems uh, if you don't have a good manure management plan. I think it was in the GPPs last year where they talked about manure management. So molting is a normal process in chickens where what they do is they lose their old feathers and they grow out new feathers. And if they're a layer, egg production stops. And in fact, their repro tract will reset to juvenile on that. And that will cause them to lose weight it usually happens after maybe a year, 18 months or so. It can take several months for the feathers to grow back. Uh, at this point, you want to supplement their nutrition, maybe even have them on a grower feed if they're, if they're not laying eggs so that they have that extra protein because there's a lot of protein in feathers and you want to make sure they're nutritionally supported. And then realize while they're clutching this chicken in this picture really, really, um, really, really tight, the process of growing out uh, new feathers can be uh, a little bit prickly and, and they can be sensitive. So be aware of that with your birds. So we saw a cool video about the reproductive tract. When we talk about chickens, there's several organ systems that they have some radical differences with us. And the other two that are much different than what we have would be the respiratory tract. They have lungs, but they don't have a diaphragm. So what they have is air sac. And when they inspire, they have to actually completely expand their chest to draw air into those air sacs. What that means is this. If you're holding your bird and you compress their chest and you don't let them expand their chest, you can actually suffocate that. So be uh, aware that when you're when you're restraining your bird, that you have um, they, they're able to expand their chest. And then there are other um, tract is their digestive tract. So let's take a, a quick look at that one. First off, chickens are omnivores. They're not vegetarians. I get that question a lot. They're, they're fine eating meat, right? Because insects are meat. They have no teeth. They do have a few taste buds. They do make saliva. So what they do is they peck at their food and the first place that it goes is their crop. And the crop is a storage organ that if it's full, you can feel it. It's, it's sort of at the base of the neck be, before the esophagus um, the esophagus runs into it and it's um, on the sort of outside of that thorax right at the base of the neck and that can be problematic if they overeat or they get it impacted with something because there's um, bones in the way that prevent that from expanding to pass all the way down. So the crop is a storage organ and then the ingesta moves down the pipes to what's known as the proventriculus. And that would be the closest analogous organ to our true stomach. That's where enzymes are secreted. And then they got no teeth. What they have is a gizzard. And a gizzard is a very hard muscular organ. It has a very tiny sort of open space in the middle of it because it's just a big muscular grinding organ and that chews up their food on the inside. And then basically it moves from that point through the intestinal pathways, very similar to ours until it pops out on the ground. And this is a normal fecal dropping from a bird. So when we go back to this one, we have our esophagus and it has comes out on the crop right at the base of the neck, goes into that proventriculus, then goes into the gizzard, and then it goes out through the pipes until it pops out the cloaca, same as an egg. So we mentioned the respiratory tract was different. And one of the ways that it's way different than ours is if you feel on your face, you can feel that really hard bony sinus that we have there. And it seals off between our respiratory, our respiratory tract and our skin. There's actually openings in that bony sinus in the birds. So if they get a lot of swelling from say a lower respiratory tract infection, they can actually have swelling in their face around their eyes because that's incomplete, um, that incomplete bony sinus there. And you can actually see some ocular discharge or conjunctivitis or, and they'll do all the other things, nasal discharge and, and sneezing and, and raspy breathing and things like that. Chickens are not the most hardy of species. That is the reason they reproduce themselves every day. Um, unfortunately, with any number of diseases that they get, actually acute mortality is one of the things we see. Number one respiratory disease that I see in chickens is mycoplasma, um, specifically mycoplasma galliceptacum. And that is because that is a bacterial pathogen that any number of different birds can carry, including songbirds and migratory waterfowl like, like ducks or geese, which means if those birds are allowed to interact with your birds, 
that is how that disease gets transmitted into your flock. And that's all part of biosecurity QA, making sure that wild birds can't interact with your flock. Digestive diseases, they get a whole bunch of these. They can have worms, which are internal parasites. We talked a little bit about coccidia. Coccidia is a protozoal parasite that is very, very common. A lot of the signs that they see uh, when they have a problem are ones that would be common to any number of species. They'll go a decrease in their egg production. If they're a layer, they'll stop eating and drinking. They'll act lethargic. Um, they might have some diarrhea or they might have some fecal staining. And again, a lot of these digestive diseases diseases like respiratory diseases, acute mortality is our first clue that something's going wrong in the flock. Any number of different external parasites can be found in backyard birds. The most common mite is the northern fowl mite that is clustered around the vent. They also have a mite called the red mite or the roost mite, and that is a nocturnal mite actually, and that is only chewing on your birds at night. So if you're looking at your birds and you see a bunch of mites on there, it's probably northern fowl, and if it just looks red and you can't find any mites, uh, that might indicate that you need to go out there at night looking for roost mites. They do get lice, um, and then they also get a, a scaly leg mite um, that they get on the scales on their legs. Um, and if you see changes in that, that's probably what it is because they don't got a bunch of them. So here's one of the things to consider that a lot of folks ask me questions about with their backyard flocks because they get really bonded to their birds. And sometimes these birds get sick and, and we have to explain that these are food animals and there are different restrictions with food animals than companion animals and using medications because we need to make sure that we are keeping our food supply safe. So chickens are food animals. Um, they produce eggs and meat that we consume. And if there are medications, they have to be approved medications because we need to know what the withdrawal time is after the medications have been uh, stopped being administered so that we can practice good residue avoidance. Um, and a lot of folks don't understand that, especially if they're keeping birds for the first time, or maybe they didn't have any um, prior livestock raising experience. But um, I used, I tell folks, you know, when I was in practice, if somebody brought a parrot in in one hand and they brought a chicken in in the other hand and they had the exact same disease, I have a number of medications that I can use to treat the parrot. I have less that I can use to treat the chicken. And with the chicken, we have to practice um, good residue avoidance by using um, a calculated withdrawal time to make sure that there's no medication going out into that um, food stream. And then the other thing that we really need to make sure we understand is with any species that we're dealing with, there are the potentials for zoonotic diseases and zoonotic diseases are diseases that can be passed from different species to different species. And there's a number of them that are carried by birds and you don't want any of them. So make sure that you understand that you need to wash your hands and practice great, um, great, you know, uh, um, biosecurity with yourself so that you are not being um, potentially putting yourself at risk for catching any of these diseases. The CDC actually periodically has to put out a notice because there's so many cases of salmonella from doing things like this, kissing your chickens, that just this past week, the CDC put another notice out that said, please don't kiss your backyard birds. We're seeing an increase in salmonella, if you can believe it. So on that note, we saved about 10 minutes for questions, and I see I got a bunch, so I'm going to dive up in there. All right, chicken brains are the size of almonds. Hmm, that's a fun fact. Do people have to cook every chicken that they have? Uh, no, um, they don't, actually. I, um, I have had several people keep birds that they've told me they've kept them until they were a ripe old age. And, and at that point, they weren't even laying anymore. They were just like pets running around the backyard. Even then, though, they're food animal. Um, Sarah asks, what are your thoughts on the salmonella vaccine? Generally, the only vaccine that I recommend is um, for Merix, although there are other ones that you can order from hatcheries when you get your birds. What I recommend to folks is assess the risk of that, maybe work with your veterinarian to see if there was any problems in the area that were noticed or problems from that hatchery that were there, or if you had some diseases already present in the flock or in the barn or in the past, um, any number of diseases can 
persist in the environment for some time, that, that might mean that those would be ones that you would um, uh, think about doing that. The best dewormers for backyard chickens, you know, there's not that many, Lisa, that are available, I guess. The first, the thing that I would recommend that you do first would be to identify the parasite before you would um, you would do that, and then uh, once you've identified the parasite, then you can find one labeled for that. There's not a lot of um, labeled backyard poultry dewormers out there. There's a number of different uh, recommendations on the internet. The problem is um, a lot of them are actually. Um, uh, incorrect or or downright illegal, and because we don't have the withdrawal times, so there's some really common internet um, uh, internet treatment protocols that are out there that actually would would technically give a lifetime ban on um, eggs or meat out of the birds. Believe it or not. All right, hey, Tim. Scott. We've got a few um, Q and A questions as well. Do you want me to go through those? Uh, I can pop up and get those. Okay. Okay. Uh, Julie, I am going to let Angie handle all 4-H questions about that. So um, Angie, if you want to pop in, I don't, uh, I don't know if you're still here, what she can use to keep their feet clean for show. So I think she's been back and forth. Uh, she's also got a beef clinic going on at the same time. Oh, that's um, busy. All right. <laughs> so I think like with the, I, I've heard with the coachings, um, some people dip their, like usually a lot of people let them go like they don't do anything to clean them um i know i've read a few things where uh people say that they have like their poop accumulate on their feet so um i've heard people put them in a bucket of water like just their legs to clean that off and they say it works pretty well tim is there any reason why they wouldn't do that or does that sound okay that's i mean there that would be fine i am i'm honestly not big on knowing sort of the show circuit stuff there um probably, uh, you know, maybe follow up with Angie offline in case she has any specific recommendation that way. But I mean, certainly no problem with water. All uh, right. So Alexander, why do sometimes, why do chickens sometimes eat their own eggs? You know, there's any number of uh, reasons for that. And, and we get that question a lot. It's generally a behavior thing. There might be a nutritional component with that. And, um, and sometimes it can be almost a competition thing for that. I do know that some folks will actually like trade out eggs for like wooden eggs so that what they peck at them, it's hard and that dissuades them. Um, making sure you collect them right away early is going to um, make it less likely that you're going to have that happen. And um, I've had some folks that if they have a chicken that is just destructive with eggs in there, they actually call that one out of the flock because it can be um, frustrating to get rid of that. Uh, Jessa says, can you recommend some first aid for a backyard chicken you see with the limp? Uh, Jessa, I cannot. I can't give any medical recommendations because um, we don't have a veterinary client patient relationship in place. What I would recommend is that you have a veterinarian examine it. And in the meantime, what I would do is I would find a place that you can quarantine the bird so that you can observe it, so that you can minimize any interaction it has with the other birds, that you can make sure it's eaten and drinking and you can give it a place um, away from the other birds so it doesn't worsen the problems. All right. How long can you keep broilers for without getting their meat too rough? Um, you know, that's a personal thing. I've actually had some, um, some dual purpose birds that they kept for a while, like a couple of years. And, you know, at that point, what they're called is sort of more like stewing birds where you're not going to just do a quick, you know, like chicken fry with them or quick on the grill. Those are ones that because they're a little tougher, if you do a low and slow cooking, um, that will break down the meat better over time. And, and honestly, a lot of people have told me they kind of like birds that way because there's a lot more flavor to them. It's just you have to adjust their cooking. I'm getting FCS questions too. This is awesome. Um, we're getting a lot of feet questions. Uh, soft tissue boost and a bit of Dawn dishwashing liquid. Thanks, Jane. Um, always great to get recommendations from your colleagues that have been doing it and they know what to do. And Julie, is there any way to unstain their feet? I guess it would depend on the stain. 
um, but I don't know. If you could, Erica, just, um, are Jane and Julie, if, if you guys are not Harrison or Jefferson clients, um, then whatever county you're in, I would contact your 4 h -er in that county so that you can get um, advice on that because this was marketed all over the place and we probably have some folks in here that are not just Harrison and Jefferson. Um, I have heard that you should feed your chicken eggshells. Is that a thing? People will do that to put some calcium back in their diet. And it actually can be like a form of grit as well. Although that would break down over time in the gizzard. They will also do oyster shells as grit in there as well. Um, so some folks will do that. Um, just because they want to add some supplement of calcium. Uh, you don't need to do that. If you have, um, you know, if you have a, a nice fresh layer feed and you're not having any problems with the eggs. Can you go to a vet if your chicken's toes are broken on one leg? What I would do is this. I would call your vet and see if they would see your bird. One of the things that I've been working on is working and teaching at the vet school, trying to increase the number of veterinarians in Ohio that we have that see poultry because we have a number of counties that don't have any poultry vets. Uh, there's a number of counties in Ohio that don't have any livestock vets. There's one county in Ohio that doesn't have any veterinarians at all in it. Um, and so we, for certain things, you know, when, when a vet goes through vet school, they do get a onboarding in treating all species. And it really is up to them if they want to see it. The nice thing about a chicken in, and a lot of folks don't realize it is you can take that to your vet. I mean, it's not like a cow where the vet has to come out. You can put a chicken in a cat carrier and you can take that to your vet if they're going to be okay seeing it and they can see it the same way they would see another pet. So contact your vet and ask them what, if anything, that they would be able to do or, or if they'd be willing to see your bird. Um, I've helped a number of people get certain things fixed that um, just by calling their veterinarian and explaining, you know, here's some basic testings or things we can do. So Angie, I'm going to, I'm going to go back. We had three questions about keeping coaching feet clean for show, what you would use to clean chicken feet for show, and how do you get stains um, off their feet? You're asking me that? Yes, those are all in the q and I'm referring all 4-H questions to you. Okay, so Aaron Best is our poultry um, key leader in this county. If those questions are coming from our Jefferson County folks, um, Aaron Best is the contact for that. Um, I will send you all an email today and she will guide you all in um, any of the questions that you have for poultry. Hey, Angie, could you... Um see if she knows the answers to those and then we, maybe we can forward that out to everyone uh, who attended today since we have their emails. Sure, I can do that. All right, and we have some great stuff in the chat. We have, that's a great uh, a recommendation, Lisa, bake it at 325 and that way if there's any residual pathogens on the eggs or inside that you make sure that you have sterilized them there. Welcome from Oklahoma. My father is Harold Waters, who works for OSU Extension. Um, I know me and Erica both know Harold very, very well. Oklahoma, outstanding. And Sarah works at the Vet College and would love to see more bird material in the program. Yeah, I do the fourth year veterinary preventative medicine rotation, um, uh, husbandry diseases, anatomy, and necropsy. Um, a, show, a snowshoe splint for toe problem. Yeah, it would depend on how bad the break and the age of the chicken and how heavy they are as well. All right, we got some great input today. Outstanding. Yeah, this is fantastic conversation. Pretty, pretty lively, I like it. All right, so now I'm jumping out of the chat because we got four Q and A's. Okay, um, all right, Skylar, we did that one. How do you know being fed enough? They always act starved. They're sort of like little Labradors that way, aren't they? Um, you should have recommendations for feed um, for size of birds generally right on the feed tag for, um, for your poultry feed. 
And do you have to go to the vet? Honestly, the whole nice thing about the veterinary client patient relationship is once I have a relationship with a client and I have seen and, 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 and we're comfortable in that relationship, I can provide guidance without them necessarily having to bring the, the pet to me. And I did that in the past. All right, good recommendations from some other um, poultry keepers on here. All right, we got one more in the chat. Oh, thank you, this was helpful. Thank you, this was awesome. This was great and lively conversation. It is 7.30. If we got one more fast one, um, I'll take it. If not, we're going to let everybody enjoy a little bit of sunshine outside still and 90 degree temps. I need to go pour water on my pepper and tomato plants, which are probably mush melted into the ground by now. Uh, just a reminder for anyone who's in Jefferson County 4-H, uh, please shoot Angie Allison an email at allison.325 at osu.edu, uh, just so she can keep track of who's here and uh, give you credit uh, if there's a project that you can get credit for for this. We have one quick question left. Would it be okay if you put straw on the outside parts and just change that? Do you mean the run? If so, people will bed the run down with straw too. Um, some people will leave it bare ground or some people will bed that down. It really depends sort of on how much management you wanna do of your chicken coop. And um, and there's a, Angie, there's another one. C keep combs clean on a chicken. All right, we, we got some people that really want to keep their birds um, nice and clean, outstanding. Yeah, if they're if they're if they're uh, an avian vet, then they they might um, do specialist. I'm I'm trying to get more regular old private practice veterinarians to see poultry because we were trained to do it, and we have an increased need because so many more people are keeping backyard birds now. All right, I do have a couple answers. Um, as far as the Jefferson County folks go, um, the, not a lot of vet, vets will work on poultry. However, Dr. Friend does. Um, he is our fair vet um, that, that, that our fair board works with, and he will come and work on um, poultry if you're having a problem. As far as the toes, um, a splint is the best way to go with that. Um, that were, and it works um, when the vet has them wrapped. As far as nutrition goes, when we were talking about the feeding, it depends on age and what type of chicken it is. So Raleigh, with that question, I would make sure um, that you send me some more information and we'll get a little bit, um, we can work on that a little bit more together. Um, and the, the last question, what was the, what was the last question? I missed that last one. There's keep the keep the coop clean and the comb will stay clean also so that keeping your habitat clean is a main part in that i'm sure the same goes for the feet too right all right gang i'm out of here good luck in show this year and have a wonderful evening